Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history for posterity. I'm Cesar Carini, your host, and our guest today is a very dear friend of mine, Ruth Congrove. Ruth has been in Wadsworth for many, many years, and she'll tell you how many years. Uh, presently is a retired school teacher and um, active in the hospital auxiliary and uh, former church organist and uh, supply church organist, all of those kinds of things. Ruth, um, how about you telling your story rather than my telling your story, even though I probably know your story as well as you know your story. But uh, tell us, um, first and foremost, uh, where you were born, when you were born, who your parents were, who your sibling is, and so forth and so on. Well, I was born in Akron um, in 1935, and uh, my mother and father um, had moved into Akron. My mother had moved to Akron uh, quite a few years before that. And, from uh, where? From Burkittsville, Ohio, which is Where's Western Burkittsville? Ohio. <laughs> Where's Burkittsville? <laughs> What's, is there a city near Burkittsville? <laughs> um, Salina. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've heard okay. of Salina. Well, good. You miss Burgettsville. It's very easy to miss. <laughs> um, she's a farm woman and uh, moved out here. Well, her that's much her, in her favor. Her sister had lived in Akron, and I I, she moved out there and, and um, lived with them for a while. Mother's maiden name? Rindler. R. I N D L E R. Right. We spell all of our names here because we don't want people to mispronounce them or misspell them when they start writing them phonetically. Course, as I understand it in German, it's Rindley. L E. L E. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this is Rindler. And, yes. And uh, first name? Rose. Rose Rindler. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, and. Um, she moved to Akron, then your father moved to Akron and met her? Yes, I think so. Because uh, he was born in, in um, Wellsville. Wellsville, down by Steubenville, yes. down mm -hmm. in that corner, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, was working in Akron. And I, Where was he working in Akron at the time? Um, he was working for the Moncrief Heating Company uh, down there, oh, by the Cascade. Right. It's no longer there. No longer anymore, there, right. But, uh, but uh, uh, that will that will really figure into his lifelong experience exactly, afterwards because yeah. of, and mm -hmm. we'll be getting into that, mm -hmm. and his contribution to Wadsworth with all of his, um, I imagine he's probably been in every home in Wadsworth, has he not? <laughs> with, with his, Either on top of it on or inside of, or on of it. Side of that, right, with the sheet metal and all of that. Uh, Ruth um, and sibling and when? Uh, Marianne, uh, she is. She was born in uh, 1947, I think, and uh, she lives in Barberton now. Marianne was born in 1947. Yeah, 35, 47. Mm -hmm. Now, um, father's first name was Alvin. Alvin. Alvin Congrove, mm -hmm. Rose Congrove, and they were married. And they came to Wads with what year? We moved here in 1938. 1938. So you've been in around Wadsworth for a long <laughs> yes, time. Yes, we have. <laughs> Some almost, well, about 61 years now mm -hmm. you've been here in Wadsworth. Try the same house. Same house. <laughs> and you yes. live in the same house where you moved. Yes. Now tell us a little bit about that, where that is. Tell us where it is, first of all, Ruth. Well, it's on Derling Drive. And, and how many houses uh, down? Third from? house down on the left. <laughs> but it used to be only the second house down on the rest. Oh, when we moved in in 1938, there were, from the corner of Broad Street down to uh, Springdale, up there on the hill, there were four houses. Four houses. Street. Now it's completely filled with houses. Two on it? our side, two on the other. Two on, that's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the house right north of you was Alvin Sifford's, Cif or rather, uh, to S Tony Sifford's house. Yeah, right, right. right. And is there, some, is there a little bit of history about that house of Tony Sifford's? I don't really know if there is. I think it was a Sears and Roebuck house. Oh, really? Yeah, purchased in 1931, oh, I, okay. I believe. And I think that he paid $1,200 for it. It's a lovely house. It's it a really beautiful is. home. It really is. Yeah. And those Sears uh -huh. and Roebuck houses well were just absolutely mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tony lived there, and of course, he died from that house. Yeah. Did he, not? Yeah. he died in the hospital. I remember the right. day that he died. He was supposed to come home the following morning, mm -hmm. and he died mm -hmm. just before he, they were going to take, take him home. Yeah. And <clears throat> uh, do you remember the Sifferts at all? I've been trying to get one of the Sifferts to talk about the Sifferts, but 
they were a little bit older than you. Elizabeth was the youngest one mm-hmm. to me. And she was younger. She was about three, four years older than I mm-hmm. am. And then there's uh, Agnes, who Agnes? was about 72 now. Yeah. And then Joseph was how old? Probably 75. Older than so. that. yeah. Yeah. And of course, they don't live around here at all anymore. No, no. Yeah, I remember Elizabeth because we used to play together out in the mm-hmm. backyard and up in her house and so forth. We go back and forth. Right. Oh, yeah. So you played with Elizabeth. Yeah. Uh, did you have anyone across the street from you at the time? No one. No, it was all open. What about Patty Lee? Well, now they moved down to that big white house across from the Steiner Drive. Right. Mm-hmm. But, um, oh, I was in school by that time. Mm-hmm. That was. She's what, much that was younger than time. we are, but is she not? Yeah. 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 Considerably younger. Than <clears> she we and are. Ron. Ron there both. Were yeah. Two of them. Right. Yeah. They don't even live in Wadsworth anymore. Mm-hmm. No. So you no. pretty well um, blazed the trail there in Building Drive. Now yeah. it's just completely filled with houses and. Uh, oh. Hundreds and hundreds of cars come right in front of your house. Tell us why. Uh, how about the high school and the <laughs> Steiner Center and the soccer fields and who knows what else? <laughs> how many houses, how many cars do you think would come there during the daytime? I would not want to guess. I bet it's over two or three thousand. <laughs> there are some times when you do not use the driveway. <laughs> At all. Right. I can imagine that. And I can remember when Durling Drive was a. What, a, a cinder road or gravel? Oh, dirt road. Dirt road. Dirt mm-hmm. road. Mm-hmm. Because, yes, because um, around the end of May or early June, the oil truck would come down and oil mm-hmm. the road, mm-hmm. and that would uh, quell the dust, and my mother For a would while. open the windows. <laughs> <laughs> and hang the wash out. <laughs> and hang the wash out. You and got there it. was nothing but, but farms all the way behind you. There was the, the Schaefer no. Farms behind you. And the, the Keller Farm. Keller Farm. The Pete yeah. Keller, that's right. There was all of that behind you. I know. And of course, Pete Keller's farm, his house and barn and other lands were up where Overlook School is. Right. Mm-hmm. The house was, I think, probably where the school is. And, and when did Pete Keller's there. son build that house right south of you then? In the 30s or 40s? I would say early 40s. Yeah, I would think early mm-hmm. 40s. And who was um, Pete Keller? A farmer. Farmer? <laughs> if he, was a, he was a farmer, and he had all of this land down here. And of course, I was, I was little at that time. And I used to get scared to death. He would walk his horses down the road, you know, and um, he'd be yelling at the horses and steering them, you know, the whole thing would be driving the horses down. It was somehow it scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> it it really did. <laughs> and, which is funny because my mother and I always used to go up to the, to the Keller house and she would talk with Mrs. Keller and mm-hmm. buy eggs or milk or whatever, you know. But, but you're afraid of the horses. It didn't help coming down the street. Well, you know, isn't that strange? Because the Cox family, who lived much, much farther south on Darling okay. Drive, yeah. way, way down, about yeah. a mile down from yeah. you, yeah. had two horses <clears throat> and a donkey. Uh, and the, um, the three, the father and the two sons, evidently did some farming south of us on Silver Creek, way, way south, maybe close okay. to Doylestone. Mm-hmm. And they would drive their wagon pulled by two horses and a mule on the back, you know, being, I guess, led, as it were, and they would be inside the wagon. Mm -hmm. And I used to go to the window to watch them do that every single morning. Mm -hmm. But in the summertime when they would do that, I would run into the house to watch them because I was afraid of those horses. (laughs) I guess horses are pretty formidable. Well, and and you know, that's strange because we did have a horse. Oh, you had a horse? Oh, yeah, eventually we did, yeah. What would you do with a horse? I rode it. Oh. <laughs> well, I mean, it was a big workhorse, you know, and yeah. I would I would get up on, on the horse. And it didn't bother you at all? No, it didn't bother me at all. But you I didn't like... Just, uh, it didn't, didn't like he didn't Pete do Cal- a Peter thing Keller, for me when Pete he Keller's drove that team, team down the street. In fact, you know, when we first moved there, you talk about change. I don't have to go out of my yard to find change because we had a two-story barn mm-hmm. and uh, four acres of land, mm-hmm. uh, an orchard of... Fruit trees right. of sorts. I remember that. And uh, so we used eventually raised cows and pigs. And what is there chickens. now? An apartment building and a two store, two car garage, three car garage. <laughs> three car garage. <laughs> and the apartment building's behind. Mm-hmm. And then there's a driveway on the south mm-hmm. that goes north. back. To- well, their driveway is on the north. Oh, they're, oh, that's right. On that's the right. other that's side. Right. Their driveway's on the north. My mother insisted that it be that way. On the north. Mm-hmm. And then the, uh, the driveway going into the school is, what, one house away from you and going into the school. I imagine that is busy all day long. Mm-hmm. 
and every it single is. Saturday, Sunday's included. It is. Yeah. yeah, it is. Ruth, um, as you were growing up, you played with Elizabeth Siffert, and some people say Seifert because it's S-E-I-F-E-R-T, but we always said Siffert. Is that what you said? We always said Seifert. Seifert. <laughs> You people there on Dirty Drive probably knew what the right word was. Tell us if I you can know. if there are any other kids that you could play with close by because you were somewhat isolated. There weren't any. No, not in the beginning. There, there just weren't any, and uh, my swing got a lot of use. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, when I went to school then, so, and I, some of the kids would come and play after school. Now, where did you go to school? At Central. And how did you get there? Walked. Every inch of the way. No. Well, you know, in the, that, that was funny, too, because when I was in first grade, no kindergarten, when I was in first grade, um, my father, of course, worked in Akron, and it was difficult for him to get me to school at a reasonable time, other than to 7 o'clock in the morning. They tell me the school wasn't open at that point. So we finally found Jessel's down the street. Right, they lived about a half mile south yeah, of you. Yeah, right. And uh, Jim wasn't being picked up either. You had to be, what, two miles away? No, you had to be within the, you had to be in the, in the, um, the reason the bus didn't pick you people up is that you were in the city. And um, Murray's were the last house in the city. And somehow or another, oh. they were permitted to be picked up for a period of time, but that was about it. Whatever. I never saw a school bus. Um, so Mr. Jessel would eventually stop and pick me up and get us all to school. Mm -hmm. Second grade, it was a little different, and I don't know why, but my father still worked in Akron, and so it was hard for him to drop me off. So you talk about babysitting. And women didn't drive in those <clears throat> days. Your mother didn't drive, nope. probably. My and mother you, didn't drive. Talk about babysitting arrangements. Mm. Whoa. You remember the B&B store down there on yes, Main Street? Yes, I used to Street? work there. Okay. <laughs> well, my father made arrangements with them. And he would drop me off at that store at 7.30 in the morning. And I'd sit there in the uh, seats that faced the school. Mm -hmm. And I'd wait until the school lights came on. And then I went across to school. And I'm sure that you <laughs> sat there absolutely quietly and never moved a muscle because that's what your father probably told you, don't you? I, there wasn't anything else you could do. That's I mean, right. all these people around, the store right. was open for business. The store, the B&B &B store used <laughs> to open at that time at 5.30 in the morning. Oh, uh, okay. To get the uh, traffic of the people going to the mat shop. Yeah. And they would stay open until right. 5.30 in the evening. Yeah. So yeah. that would be 12 hours of, uh, of business. I, I don't think the babysitting service would fly today, actually. No, no, <laughs> not without a huge compensation. And they probably did it for nothing. Oh, yeah. And they knew I was there. I, you know, they, they knew that I was there. And uh, I just simply got up and walked across when the lights came on. And you were in the first grade at Central School? That was second grade. Second grade. Where'd, yeah. you, where'd you go to first grade? Well, first grade. I was there, too. Oh, yeah, 12 years. 12 years. So you went oh, yeah. to Central School for 12 years. And did you have, uh, you've seen this program before, but have you had any of the teachers whose names have not been mentioned? Who are some of the teachers that you can remember? Well, Jenny Harpster. Yes, everyone. Velma Birkbeck. Velma Birkbeck, yes. Um, She's a tough one, isn't Bell she? Belle Lytle. Bell Lytle. Dorothy Rohr. Dorothy Rohr. And um, Miss Nolf. Mm -hmm. Lulu, Lulu Nolf. Nolf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You had them all. Down, second grade, <laughs> down in the dungeon. Now, knowing fully well what your personality is like, they shaped that personality for you. Now, which one of those um, was your role model that caused you to become a teacher? Miss Lytle. Miss Lytle. Tell Definitely. us how and why. Definitely. I don't know. I just really, I really liked her. She was in full control, but she was kind. And she... She just really had a good way with the kids. Well, you uh, well, in your teaching were in full her. control all the time, too. <clears throat> well, yeah. Um, to an extent, yes. To yes. an extent? <laughs> I've talked with your <laughs> to students. my extent. Well, to your, I've talked with your students. You were in full control at all times. Uh, Ruth, before we get to the teaching part there, how about going through the high school then? And who the, some of the people who were your close friends in the high school? Well, um, Bernice Heath and Marilyn Kale. Bernice Heath and oh, Marilyn yeah, Kale. Yeah, and Marilyn Kale yeah. is now a nun, is that yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, still is. Roberta Connell and uh, Catherine Connell. Yes. Um, in fact, Roberta and I went to uh, college the first year together. Really? Mm hmm. And, um, oh, gee. Um, Dolores Burbage. 
Yes. And I'm giving maiden names here. I'm not. Well, that's I'm right. Getting, that's right. I'm that's not right, getting yeah. married names. I but, still call um, all of these people by their maiden uh, names anyway. Janice Christian. Janice Christian. Oh, yeah. Yes. All those kids. Yeah. So one of the things we try to do in this program is to get a, a wide variety of people, so that we can get just mm -hmm. about everybody's name mentioned on the program, mm -hmm. uh, either through friendship or relationships or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, Bernice and I were fairly close. We used to lock her together in uh, in gym class and a few other things, and uh, we. Uh, Are you aware of the fact that Wadsworth is the only place, just about the only place in my travels that I've found that we say we lockered together? People say, my locker mate. We always say lockered together. Yeah, we did. Yeah. It's an impropriety in the English language because locker is a, a noun and we use it as a verb. But we locker together. That's what we always said. Yeah. And I would say that from place to place where I would go and they would say, I've never heard that before. I said, well, what do you call the person? <laughs> well, my locker mate, right? He, we had our lockers together. They never say locker together. So it must be something indigenous to Wadsworth. Ruth, um, Bernice lived where? Oh, you know, I can't remember. South End. Water Street, yeah, Water down Street, South yeah. End someplace. And um, um, uh, tell us the significance about uh, your friendship with Bernice. Well, I'm not sure there's any significance. Um, uh, Bernice was African American. African American, which of and, course was uh, something in those days with, that wasn't that's very right, common. That's right. And we never thought anything never about thought it. Never thought of it. Not a thing. No. She lockered with me, and uh, we were always uh, good friends. Uh, served on the yearbook staff together, and all of that. I'm know, reminded that gallons. our kids had never <laughs> seen an Afro American uh, until Jim and Gwen Rivers came over our house, to our house mm -hmm. one night. And they brought their little uh, children, uh, whose names were Socrates and Demetrius, mm -hmm. named after Greek doctors here in Wazith who delivered them. Now they call them Sock and John, but it was Socrates and Demetrius. And our kids played with them for the entire evening. When it was all over with, I tried the old teacher experiment. Uh, did you see anything different about those kids? And our oldest son, who was at that time about four or five years old, sat there and thought and thought and thought and thought thought and thought and thought and thought and said, well, they have funny names. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing that he saw that was different. So underneath, it was a yeah. sweetheart of a girl. I just oh, remember yes. her. She was a she, tremendous she was. girl. She is. And the, yeah. she had a brother, too, mm -hmm. uh, who was Rich. Richard. Richard? Uh, Neat, Richie. Yes. Richie. Richie, yeah, who was a very, very fine young man. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, um, <laughs> if one were to try to, uh, to establish the um, differences in Wadsworth, between the Afro-Americans and the whites, the only thing that you could say is that the color of their skin, because there was no one thought anything about it. And I'm so pleased with that. And no, so we're, no. I, we, we're yeah, so proud of that. It's always been that way. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a nice thing. Ruth, um, then as you went through school, um, who were some of the high school teachers who pretty well impelled you to be uh, the teacher that you finally became? I think Mr. Cooper, Oliver Cooper. Oliver Cooper, now dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oliver Cooper yeah. taught English. Yeah. And he, why uh, would it? Why was someone is so genteel and warm and sensitive? I don't uh, know. He was an excellent teacher. Oh, very good and, teacher. And uh, he, I, I can remember when I was in um, seventh and eighth grade, uh, he coached me for the spelling bees. And. Uh, Did you ever uh, go to the spelling bee? Pardon me. Did you ever go to the spelling bees? Oh, yes. And how far did you get? I won the, uh, the Wadsworth B when I was in eighth grade. And you won it. Uh, went to Akron. Akron. Of course, the, the situation was, the setup was different oh, in those completely. days. There was only one final B in Akron, right. not all of these little. Mm -hmm. I think I got to 15th place. That's wonderful. That's well, I right. thought it was, but. You bet. Out, of, <laughs> out of several thousand kids, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. I, um, uh, one of the things of which I am proud, and it's not very much at all, but I'm very proud that I held, the, I hold, to this day, I hold the, the longevity or the tenured um, position of having been the um, spelling bee pronouncer for the Akron Beacon Journal uh -huh. for 35 years. Okay. And then I spent 10 years at the National Bee uh, before I retired everything. And uh -huh. now the only thing that I do is spelling bees. So that's why I asked you if you ever got that far. Yeah, it, it was fun. Uh -huh. I, I enjoyed doing it. It's a, oh, it's it was a, a lot, lot of fun. fun. And it's a, it's yeah. a good thing, you know, it's a good thing for, as, as for that, that discipline and perfection. Well, and you, your vocabulary increases as you well, do it. <laughs> it's good <laughs> to have to a big say. vocabulary when you're in school. <laughs> you graduated from high school, and then you went to college. Where'd you go? Kent State. 
And why did you choose Kent State? Well, simply because, well, it was a local school. It was a state school. But frankly, in those days, um, with the credits that I had in uh, Wadsworth and from the schools, I had mostly business courses, very few college prep courses. And so a state school was about the only one that would take me. So Kent State was it. And you went to Kent State. I did. We're going to come back to that and go into your teaching part of it. But before we do that, tell us what your father did all of his life here in town that made him a very well-known figure. My father was a sheet metal worker. And put in furnaces. That's right. Uh, put, in, put up spouting. Uh, put roofing <clears throat> on. Um, as I said, he worked in Akron. And then he came out here. He <clears throat> went into business with... Mr. Ream, Ream, up there on Broad Street. And the two of them worked together for a couple of years. Where was Mr. Ream's, the significant, where was Mr. Ream's shop, as it were, on Broad Street? It must have been there at the house. It's the second house. Now it's the second house in on Broad Street. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway... They were together for a couple of years, maybe longer. I, I don't remember how Wasn't long. there a time that they had that barn there, the, um, you know, the hot one behind the, the historic house on Broad Street? Didn't they have a sheet metal in there for a while? Gosh, I don't know. I thought they did. I don't know. But I'll find out tonight because someone Anybody? will call me and really <laughs> read me out for saying the wrong probably, thing. Probably, probably. And then my, then my father <clears throat> um, made his own business and had his business downtown. Which was where? On Main Street, where the Isley store was. It's now Domino's, but it was Isley's then. There's an alley right, <clears throat> right beside there, and my father's shop was back in that alley. Which was that before that was belonged to whom? I don't know. Was Roy Moore's tree surgery? Yeah, yeah. Was in there? That's now, right, yeah. Let's give that geographically. From the southeast corner of uh, Main and Broad Street, Mm -hmm. approximately 150 yeah. feet or so. Mm -hmm. There's an alley that goes back another 150 feet or so yeah. and behind there. Mm -hmm. And you used to be able to get into it also from, from, Broad, Street. The, from Broad Street, but now you can't do that anymore. No, that's right. Because they put yeah. a little building right. there. Right, but there, it was all open then. It was right <clears> open. <throat> it was right back yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. And um, I suspect that you probably didn't become heavily involved with sheet metal work at that time even though there were only two girls in your family and no boys, and usually men will take their no. daughters and make them work. No. But <laughs> what do you remember about the difference in sheet metal, just, for instance, in spouting, so that we can get a historical perspective on spouting? How did your father hang spouting, and what did he? how did he make it, or did he make it? He made it in his own shop. How? I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't there to watch him. They had presses. Uh, he, um, I don't know. I mean, he had long workbenches, and he just simply cut and... He would spot. cut it. Now they have a machine uh, that um, has no, this it by hand. great big yeah. roll and yeah. they stick it through yeah. and it no, comes out a 300 feet long if you want With the to. vice and, and everything else that he had there. He, right. he made it, but he had, to, he had to form it and it was yeah. done through. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And roofing, oh, this this man, he would do those, those big bank barns mm -hmm. like... Um, um, out at your, out, out your way. Um, Yaki's? Yeah. And, um, Hollinger. 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 Those big barns, you know. And he would go out and he would be, you know, climbing that roof and putting the roofing on or fixing the spouting. It didn't bother him a bit. He's like a cat on a roof, you know. I mean, the guys that worked with him, <laughs> they didn't want to go up there, but he was already up there. They and he never fell. Choice. No, no, no. He'd slip a couple of times, but he never fell. Oh, mercy. You know, and uh, trust me, it did not... Uh, I, it, it did not pass through. <laughs> <laughs> I stand there. I put the ladder up to the house, and I'm, my neighbors will probably howl because I stand there and I look up there for about five minutes before, As if I, get something to, <laughs> before I get the courage to climb up two steps on the ladder. <laughs> Didn't take one bit. And he was uh, slight of build. He was. Mm -hmm. He was a thin. He's very thin. And uh, uh, fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And tell us what kind of truck he drove and what it looked uh, like. He drove an old Chevy truck, mm -hmm. and it was one, one of those, what, 1923, yeah. 1921 trucks. He drove that for years. Oh, if, if he, you had that now, Ruth, you oh. could sit back and tell the whole world what to do. Probably. Mm -hmm, because Probably. that would be worth thousands Although, of, as I recall, they had, didn't they have a contest one time to see who had the oldest truck? 
and somebody beat him out by a couple of years. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I don't know who it would have been. I just love that old truck. I oh, still, we did too. Uh, I have a real passion for old cars. I've never had the mm -hmm. money to put, to put uh, yeah. the passion to work. Yeah. But I have an old passion, a passion for old cars. And that truck, I would have absolutely loved to have that right now. Yeah. Just so to look he, at it. But he finally, he finally got rid of and got a different truck. But he got he a different truck. But do you remember that truck? Oh, yeah. yes. And you used to ride in it? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. That was your, your family car almost, wasn't it? No, we had another we had car. another car. We had another car, but a lot of times we would do that. We'd just drive it. You know, it. and those days when he had the shop downtown, um, that's when the carnival was on Main yes, Street. Right. And so he and a lot of other people, proprietors, would park their cars on the streets so they get a good place for the carnival. Mm -hmm. and, and we'd come down and, and, and uh, Sit in the, in the circulate in the carnival, <laughs> yeah. Leave it up to Ruth to, to get hey, in there. Hey. Ruth, uh, going back now, we'll come back to your, your, your family here in a couple of minutes, but um, uh, how about going to um, um, Kent State? You graduated from Kent State, and where did you start teaching? Parma. Parma. And My you taught there job. for a good long time, did you not? Four years. I was only four, there four was that, years. I thought the forever. No, no, no. four years. That and was what it. school in Parma? Uh, Densler. Densler. Mm -hmm. And then you came where? to? Uh, from Densler, then I came back here. I lived at home, and I taught in Copley, Copley. for five years. Which, and which then, building in Copley? Uh, Fort Island. Fort Island. Yeah. Who was the principal at the time, Fort Island? Oh, um, I, I don't remember now. Don't remember the principal? No. Okay. I can see him, but I can't remember what his name is now anymore. If it, um, if it comes to you. Yeah. yeah, okay. And then I went to Revere. Went to Revere, Bath, Revere. And you were in the Bath School, which 25 is... 25 years. 25 years. How yes. many years in teaching did you have altogether? 34. What are some of the experiences that... Um, well, I was going to say that you could tell um, uh, 2020, if they ever, <laughs> ever got a hold of you, uh, chances of getting 2020 uh, in Wadsworth aren't too terribly great, but uh, what, what are some of the experiences... I'd have and, to say my first year. And what was that? Well, this was the newest building in Parma at the time. In fact, it was so new, it wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we weren't in it. It was one of those, you know, they were building it. Well, you'll be ready. You'll be in it when school starts. Right. Well, in two weeks. Well, in another four weeks. Well, in another week, you know, gradually. Um, so consequently... The first day of school, um, we had, we were divided. Our staff was divided. Half of us were in an old community hall in Parma, and the other half were in Seven Hills uh, with the other teachers mm -hmm. of the Seven Hills school building. So here we are in this community hall uh, down at the end of the street, and um, uh, you know, during the week, uh, you taught, and on Fridays you put everything away because the community used it mm -hmm. on the weekends, so you couldn't you couldn't have anything out. Um, you know, the little rolling blackboard that mm -hmm. was all you had, and we were up. Uh, let's see, it was a two-story building. We had three teachers upstairs, three classrooms, with dividers that did not go to the ceiling. Wow! So you could hear from one end to the other. And then downstairs, we had two grades, the same thing, dividers. The great way to start teaching. A great, you can lose your vocation in a hurry with that kind of thing. <laughs> it was fun. It, you know, we made it fun. Because if you didn't, we'd be at each other's necks. Oh, I'm because sure. you could I'm hear sure. everything oh, possible, course. you know. But it had its funny, it, it had its funny moments. For example, um, well, in the first place, I lost the toss. I was the end room by the stairs, and anybody who had to go, you know where, I had to go through the back of my room and downstairs, you know, and the whole class was going to the cafeteria. We did have a cafeteria. But you went down through your All room. of them went through the back of my room and downstairs to the cafeteria. I thought, I've got to learn to pick better. <laughs> anyway, um, one day, we had a substitute. We had one woman that would substitute for us. No one else would dare. Nobody well. would touch us with a 20-foot pole, you know. But this one woman said, oh, girls, don't worry about it. I'll be there anytime you need me. Wonderful. So she was there at the end room. And sometime in the afternoon, we were all studying. And it was pretty quiet. And all of a sudden, we heard this terrible slap, bam, whop. And I thought, 
you know, and the kids sat there and think, what is going on, you know, but we're not doing anything the rest of the afternoon, you know. <laughs> it was quiet the rest of the afternoon. I thought, whoa. So finally, at the end of school, and the kids were all gone, and we went over and we said, what in the world were you doing? She said, what? Well, I saw all the noise you were making, that slap, bang, whop. She said, Oh, that! She said, I was killing wasps. She had a newspaper rolled up and she was walking the... <laughs> Straighten out that classroom in a hurry. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, it was... Ruth, in 25, like 20, 32 years you taught, right? Four. 34 years that you taught. Did you have any of your students who, uh, well, flew to the moon or anything like that? No, I didn't. <laughs> Not that I know of. What, were, what are some of the, your students doing now or anybody that is of note? Well, they're all of note, obviously, but anyone who's doing something which the newspapers pick up as note. I, I really don't see that. I, I see them, you know, going to college, and I see mm -hmm. them. Well, of uh, course, Bath Ridgefield so uh, yeah. Yeah. had has one of the highest uh, levels yeah. of people going to college. Yeah. yeah. Back home, you have two other things that have been these, oh, actually distinguished you and helped you to distinguish our city. And um, one is music and the other is volunteerism. And how about touching on both of those things and then, um, since you're too humble to say something about your uh, talents and, and, your, and your philanthropies, uh, maybe we'll ask you some questions and force you to do so. <laughs> of course, I understand, fully well I understand fully well that you probably will slug me, but that's all right. Uh, you've, yeah. That's not the first time. Off the set. <laughs> Off the set, right. So tell us a little bit about the music. What did you do with your music? Well, uh, I started singing in the choir at church at Sacred Heart, and that was when Father Andes was here, yeah. which was in the 60s. How many years ago would that be? I was in the 60s. Yes, it was. Early 60s. Uh -huh. Yeah, 60s, 61. He died in 63. Okay, it would be um, probably around 61 then, because I was living in Parma, and then I came back, mm -hmm. and he was still here. And so he said, well, he said, I don't know whether you can sing, but you can join the choir if you like. And so I did. And I sang with the choir then for well, quite actually, a while. Well, you have a very pretty solo voice. Well, then we started, yeah, we did a little bit of that. No, you, you, you're, you're, um, you're, you're not letting me give you the compliments here, Ruth. <laughs> you have a beautiful solo Thank voice. You. Um, we did, yeah, you did some weddings and th things like that. Uh, and then... Um, uh, Bertha Ratta was the organist. Still is. Still is. <laughs> 96 years Still old. Is. Comes every day. I'll tell you. Anyway, she suggested that I might want to play the organ. And... Uh, Pal her off. So she wouldn't have to come seven days a week? Is that no. What so I could just fill in sometimes yeah. when, she was, when she wanted to go away, you know. And I, oh, I sat down. I, this is love at first sight. You know, I, I just would give anything to be able to play that organ. And here I am sitting there, actually, this close and actually playing it. Now, I, you had learned piano yeah, as a girl. Mm -hmm. And how many years of lessons did you take? Oh, a lot. A lot of <laughs> a lessons. A lot of lessons, yeah. Um, probably, what, 10, 12 years of lessons. Play very well. Yeah. So anyway, uh, then I, st I, I started uh, to play. and. Um, she would have me fill in for her when she went on vacation. And then um, the changes started coming in the church, and they wanted music at all of the masses, not just one that she was doing. And so she was trying to f wildly to find organists for the other masses very quickly. And um, so I volunteered to do one, and she said, well, and I always remember that because she said, I was afraid to ask you because I was afraid you'd quit choir, and then I wouldn't, we, you know, we need you there. <laughs> so, but I said, no, I would still like to do one mass, uh, an organ, if you, if you will have me. And that's what started it. And, and then how did, you, how did you, how did that progress? Well... Uh, with a great deal of encouragement, and fa then Father McMahon came, and uh, you added another mass, or I played another mass, and uh, uh, it just it just evolved from one thing to the other, and then gradually I, I started choir directing, and uh, uh, by that time then Father Conry came, and uh, he suggested that I be the music director for the parish. Uh, he needed somebody, and uh, I said, okay. So we took it from there. And it became a full-time weekend commitment. Well, really, that's true. That's true. And then did weddings on the side or funerals or... 
Whatever needed to be whatever done. Needed, whatever was needed there. Well, after yeah. knocking yourself out for many, many, about 30, 35 years on yeah, that, yeah. Uh, you finally retired to something a little bit less um, uh, demanding, but you still do, uh, what, one or two masses a week? I still do a mass a weekend, yeah, and then, most of the time. Um, and I'm still, and I'm still back the singing with the choir. Yeah, and so you don't have, you don't have the full commitment. You, you, you may go out to walk your dog if you want to on a Sunday, if you want need to, but you used That's to true. all day Sunday. Yeah, I know, sure. it was. It was three and four masses a weekend. It was, it was uh, It's a commitment. Than, it is a true commitment, but it's a joyous one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it no, it no really is. I loved that. it very now, much. Um, uh, what were some of the changes? So we have this for historical evidence. What are some of the changes that came about in the church music as you remember it in the 35-year period? The um, bringing on of different types of choirs, contemporary choirs, uh, using guitars and other instruments mm -hmm. as well, and uh, using contemporary music, uh, this type of thing, And. Did you um, play along with that, or were you somewhat traditional as I am? Uh, Music-wise, I tried to use some of their music mm -hmm. in my masses, yes, in the masses that I did. I tried to use some of that. Um, and particularly if you're doing weddings, you know, you have to keep up with that sort of thing and use other music too. Um, that's, you know, in that respect. And, and I understand what you're saying. Um, for many, many years, I did quite a few weddings, but I played for quite a few weddings and have sung for quite a few weddings. I began getting a little cooled off when they came up with some of the songs that I didn't think were, you know, like um, a lady one time asked me if I would play, I did it my way for a funeral. Mm -hmm. well, I didn't feel that I could do that. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that people ask you, and they have a right to ask, you know, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's being taken over by, by other people and other types of uh, uh, choirs. We'll come back to that, but how about going to your um, volunteerism and how you got involved with it in the first place and tell us where you are with that now. I mean, wherever you go, you start out as, well, uh, oh, by the way, is uh, is this where uh, where they uh, have a choir and you sing and the next thing you know, you're directing the choir yeah. and the music director. <laughs> You go to the hospital and say, uh, oh, what's that lady back there with that striped suit on? Uh, and she seems to be telling people what rooms to go to. And the next thing you know, you're the president of the whole no. <laughs> so Tell us about that, Ruth. Well, uh, to be honest, I never thought of doing this at all. Um, the year before I retired, um, I was playing tennis. In the, uh, we have a tennis league, and I play tennis in, in the summertime in the league. And one of, the, one of my friends, we were talking the one day, and um, I was mentioning that I probably was going to retire at the end of the year. I thought I would. And she said, you know, she said, I think you should try the volunteering at the hospital. She said, you're a very people-oriented person. She said, I think you would do well in that. I think you should try. But you're so unfriendly, Ruth. Right, I know. <laughs> I know. Anyway, I bite easily, you know. Um, anyway... So I wrote it down along with everything else. But that was really the first thing that I explored. How did you do it? How did you do how did you how did you go about doing that? I think I called. I think I called out at the hospital. Who did and you call, do you remember? It. Well, they were in transition at the time and I think I talked I'm not sure whether I talked to Maggie Razor. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, but then they said come out and talk to us and I said, Okay. Well, I did. I went out and I talked to uh, Carol Ralston, I think. And, um, and then I didn't hear anything from anybody for quite a while. And I thought, well, um, I, I don't know. And then one day on the street, I ran into a friend of mine, and she was talking to somebody else who happened to be Joan Mager. And Joan was involved with the uh, volunteers also. And I said, gee, I, I hadn't heard anything. She said, you go out and talk to Maggie Razor. I said, okay. So I went out, and um, that started it. Uh, they um, uh, interviewed, and we do. We interview you and see what you want to do and so forth. And Are they all women? And I got, no, we had men too. And what do the men do? They don't sit Same at the thing. desk. Same thing. They sit at the desk? They do anything that we do. I've never seen men sit at the desk. Well, they may not, maybe. The, yes, um, uh, Tony Police was. Tony and Joe. Oh, really? Uh-huh. They were doing them, yeah. Well, anyway, um, so eventually I started. And at that time, we had the nourishment cart. 
and I took the nourishment cart around to the. No, you didn't have any samples people. on the way up the river. No, 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 no. <laughs> Strictly for them, uh, and you had you you went twice. First, you sold things like um, newspapers. Yeah, newspapers, Kleenex, uh, toothpaste, things like that. And then the, you came back and you waited in the gift shop until the nourishment cart was ready, and then you took the nourishment cart around. Well, while I was waiting for the cart to be uh, readied by the cafeteria, I would sit there in the, in the, in the uh, gift shop, and I would always look at the um, cook over there to see what she was doing. And I thought, I think I could do that. Cook? Mm-hmm. So uh, eventually they discontinued the cart within the year, and I had to do something. And I said, Maggie, I'd like to cook. I, I, I'd rather be there. Really? So she said, okay, we need that. So I trained with her, and that's, that's it. And I, do, I could do cook. Mm -hmm. What do you cook? In the, in the uh, uh, snack bar there. You cook in the snack bar? Yes. What do you cook? The best hamburgers in town. Oh, well, I'm sure they would be. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody says this. <laughs> I'm sure they would be. Now, um, you don't you don't sit out at the desk. Then? No, no, no. I don't. You, no, you no, do no. the cooking. No, no. I, I cook. Have you always liked to cook? Yes. Yes. Of course, I love to yeah. cook myself. Yeah. Unfortunately, I eat it, but it's uh, good. We'll take you. When would you like to sign up? <laughs> Now, we do four things in the auxiliary. We uh, man the snack bar, we cook, and these are all four-hour shifts, mm -hmm. keep that in mind. We work in the gift shop, and uh, we do escort service, wheeling the patients where they need to be. I'm glad you, you know. That's, that's it. <laughs> uh, nothing else. Uh, we wheel them in and out, or we uh, also bring them up from the uh, uh, recovery room recovery to room. the rooms, mm -hmm. uh, so forth. And uh, we have several men involved in that a part of it. Now, I knew that the men did that. But we have some men cooks. Who are some of the men cooks? Um, Ken Hildy. From, yes, I know from Ken. From Ritman. And um, in fact, Mark Friedley was just uh, in, was just training now to he's, do this. Mark is learning how to cook. Hey, he's learning. I hope he knew how before he started. Oh, I'm sure anyway. he would. Mark can do anything. And then we also uh, use the surgical liaison desk in the in the lobby where you're a contact person between the surgery right. and the family. Who are some of the people who work with you, Ruth? Well, um, Russ Heller is uh, one of the director of volunteers. He and Joe Police together. And uh, on my on my shifts, gee, I work. I have three different shifts. Who do I work with? Ellen Madigan mm -hmm. and Carol Ralston. Mm -hmm. And I work with Doris Witt mm -hmm. and uh, Hazel Kramer mm -hmm. and uh, Peg Lang. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with uh, Margaret Fike for a long time. Margaret has retired. We still try to get her back in to sub. And uh, Joe, Joe Ty, Arlene Jenny. Joe Ty? Mm-hmm. Joe Ty? Mm-hmm. You Joanne? mean musician Joe Ty? Joanne Ty. Oh, Joanne Ty. Okay, Joe okay. Ty Joanne Ty. All right. <laughs> There's a Joe Ty to male. No. And Arlene Jenny. Arlene also. Jenny. But, and uh, Lois Wiley. Lois Wiley. No, not no, Wiley. Not Wiley because she's... Uh, uh, Wyrath. 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 Lois Wyrath, yes. Mm -hmm. Who Which are, we keep trying to get her to cook because she was with the Isley store for so long. Right, that's right. This. <laughs> How many, who, is, who are some of the oldest people in the uh, auxiliary? Theora McMacken. She is still there? Yes, Roberta Kaler. Oh, my heavens, uh -huh. really? Yes, yeah. Do you think that you now can they convince handle, them to come on the program? Handle, pardon me? Could you convince them to come on the program so we can get the, the history of the sure. auxiliary? Sure. Try them. Why not? Yeah, that's your um, job now, Ruth. Now, they do the financial end of it. They keep track of the finances. I don't care, just the they're the oldest ones. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have a very, very difficult time getting people to come on to this program. I, I've, um, I've learned the, the spirit of rejection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can clear a room by walking into a, in, into a yeah, place. Everybody like, slithers out of the side. Yes, out. right. But uh, it takes ten times longer to get people to come onto the program yeah, than it does to yeah. interview them. But I, you know, I think it's worthwhile because this is the only way that we can record their own right. history. That's right. That's right. And um, well, I'll tell you, I, I just really enjoy working there uh, at the hospital. It's uh, you know, you're there for a common cause, a common right. good. Now, tell us, Ruth. And it's fun. Uh, what position you hold at the hospital? 
Well, I'm president of the auxiliaries oh, right just now. By, <laughs> so you're president of the, of the auxiliary well, right now. You know, and there again, um, I had done, um, I had held an office before. I was one of the treasurers, paid the bills. And um, so we came up two years ago, a year and a half ago, and they, they were looking for a new slate of officers. And, and um, Hazel talked to me, and she said, how would you like to be the treasurer? And I said, well, I think I could handle that. And then about two or three weeks later, it was, how, how do you think, uh, do, would you like to be the assistant treasurer? I said, yeah, I've done that before. It wouldn't be too bad. Well, about two days later, she called me on the phone. And she said, you know, we have the best slate of officers, just wonderful. We have this, 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 rattling them right off. And she said, they're, they're just so good. She says, and all we need is a, uh, is a president, and we thought you'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> So you did it. How long have you been president? This is the second year. Second year. Now, I heard two or three things here that have, have, have raised some questions in my mind. Where, did the, where does the auxiliary get its money? Why do they have to have a treasurer? Um, first of all, and not just through membership dues, uh, we have a marvelous gift shop. And, uh, the, in other words, you have to pay dues to belong to this oh, organization. Yes, yes, you do pay dues. You pay dues to work. That's right. Yeah. Are the dues uh, very expensive? No. No. Five dollars. A year? Yeah. That, that's not bad. Well, you, anyway. Can you pay, pay with MasterCard? As I said, yeah, right. We have uh, a really good, well-stocked gift shop. And uh, the, the people come in and they do buy a lot of things from the gift shop. It's amazing. And, uh, that yeah. the and also from the snack bar, we, we sell a lot of hamburgers and cheeseburgers. Which you cook. Yeah. Which yeah. you cook. Yeah. And then what about uh, the other question that comes to my mind? Uh, to have an organization that has a president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and, and um, uh, at-large delegates and so forth, you must have a, a lot of people. How many work there? I don't, know how, I don't know how many. We have over 100 volunteers. I don't, wow. 150 volunteers? 150. I, I, somewhere around there. I, I'm not sure of the number. And uh, you say that Russ Haller is in charge of all of the volunteers? He and Joe Police, this is the last he two years. He and Joe yes. Police are in charge of mm -hmm. all of the volunteers. What do they have to do then? They train the volunteers. They interview them. They see where they want to go. They schedule them in the right places uh, to be uh, to train and so forth. So they're, And any problems that come up with the volunteers, if there are any, then they... They work it out. Let's go back to your They're music. really good. Let's go back to your music for just a little bit. Have you done things outside the church in terms of music? I, I sang for a number of years with the Akron Symphony Chorus. Uh -huh. and <laughs> like 20 plus. 20 plus years for the Akron Symphony. Yeah. And um, who, whom do you remember in the Akron Symphony as being the the directors? You served in about four of them. Dr. Uh, McDonald. McDonald's Death the first John one. McDonald, first of all. And he was there most of the time mm -hmm. that I was there. In fact, uh, he interviewed me to start with. And uh, uh, and you had to audition for it, right? Oh, yes. You had and to audition for it. the only way that you can get a job is do. to be better than the next person. That's right. And you were you, there for 20 you years. You so that means that yeah. you're a pretty good singer. Yeah. It's a very good singer. And your your voice is what, alto? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then who was the song? <clears throat> yeah. In high school, I was a soprano, you know? And I wanted choir for the... Oh, I just really wanted to sing in the choir so badly. But I didn't quite make it. And finally, by the time I got there, in the senior year, I made choir. And by that time, my voice was changing. <laughs> I was in the alto <laughs> You were growing up. <laughs> there is no justice. <laughs> right. What about the uh, <clears throat> the the next uh, director you had over there? Well, uh, Kelly Curtis. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Curtis. Curtis was there, and uh, she had a horrible lot of overlaps. Yeah, she did while she was mm -hmm. uh, directing. She was that. paralyzed then. Mm -hmm. She still kept on doing. But that. she came back long enough to conduct mm -hmm. one final concert. I, I was there for that. With mm -hmm. us. That's right. Mm -hmm. You were narrating with it. I narrated it. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it I, was a tremendous program. Not because I narrated it, but it's a tremendous program. Yeah. About 125 people in the chorus and mm -hmm. so forth. Then, yeah. then what other directors did you have? Well, sometimes we had guest uh, mm -hmm. conductors come in, and I remember the, the the biggest one I remember was Dr. Robert Shaw. The biggie. Uh, that we sang He's under dead him. now. Mm -hmm. but, but that he was, was the a biggie, thrill. Known throughout the United yeah, States. So you sang for Dr. Robert Shaw, mm -hmm. one of the finest And conductors. sometimes, you know, uh, Lewis Lane was directing the orchestra at that time, mm -hmm. and sometimes he would direct the whole thing, mm -hmm. and so you sang under him too. Alan Balter. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's now also dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had some very 
very good people to sing and under. And you, you sing some pretty heavy stuff. So you're not just oh, yes. a little... Um, 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 we sang every Latin mass there was, I think. Well, I'm sure, <laughs> right. You have a, you know, a, a tremendous background here in the music and certainly one to be proud of and certainly one which has... Um, accrued to the to the enjoyment of mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of people in Wadsworth, and that was yeah, so good. It, it, it was fun. We enjoyed it. And now me. going uh, for another second back to your earlier childhood, um, <clears throat> you talked about this four-acre farm that was back there, peaches and so forth and so uh -huh. on. Uh, what do you remember about the peaches and the vegetables and so on, all of that, and your front yard? And my front yard? Yeah. Did you sell them? You never sold them? No. I, the, the, we had the, the trees there, but they were, really weren't um, uh, sprayed and taken mm -hmm. care of like you would have to if you were going to sell them. Uh, I always know. thought but that there was always something out in your front yard. I don't think we ever did. I don't think or, so. No, no, mm -hmm. no, uh -uh. no, no. We just, uh, my mother eventually uh, sold butter and uh, she raised chickens and she would dress chickens and sell the chickens. Maybe that's what I'm thinking things of. Things like that. I know that but, some, um, so, and, and what yeah. part did you play in this? Not much. Now, you would not go up I on the roof. I used to churn the butter. Could we do, okay. could, do we do that much? Yes. <laughs> you would not go on the roof. No, no, no. But no, you, would not, no, no. you would not butcher a chicken either. No, no, no. No, but no. you would churn the butter. My, I would churn the butter, yes. And I could tell us how you churned the butter. Well, in the first place, it was not electric, and so you would just, we just by hand. keep turning it by hand. And then, yeah. how do you make then butter? we put a how motor on it. How do we used to it? make butter? Why don't you ask me an easy question? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I can ask you the chemical composition. Well, of course, it. the 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 uh, cream separator was separated into cream and, and uh, milk, and and you took the cream and then eventually just made it into butter. But and you had to do a lot of cranking. And then yeah, and then my my father put a motor on on the ch on the churn, and so you would just crank it up a little bit, and then the motor would take care of it, mm -hmm. would, would churn it from there, and my and mother would sell it. Was it good butter? Oh, yeah. Very uh, good butter. Right. 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 Yeah. <clears throat> Compared to uh, some of the early margarines that were coming. That was when the margarines were first coming out. You know, and with they were the, white. With the, the button that you yeah. pushed and, the, and the, the margarine turned yellow or yeah, they, whatever. The, um, the dairy farmers wouldn't permit the margarine to be, to be yellow. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, they finally gave in <laughs> yeah. after people. Yeah. Um, no, we sold butter uh, to a lot of people in town. And then, as I said, she raised chickens and she would whack the chickens and, and uh, dress them. And, and you never did that, though? No, 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 I no. didn't do that. Either. Now, uh, uh, teaching days again. Um, of all of the classes that you've had, and how many would you would have had? 34 at least. Yeah. 34 classes that you had. Was there one that was outstanding that you just, you know, kind of sit and drool about every now oh, and then? Oh, I think you always have. And it, which yes. ones, where are they now? What are those people doing oh, now, I, you know? I have no idea. It's hard to keep <laughs> you track of You lose track things. of them after a while. It's very now, difficult to know. keep track of them. But I, and again, um, even though I am reti retired, I do go up and volunteer one day ah, a week. Oh, <laughs> really? What do you do? <laughs> At school. I work in the library. And how do you do that? Well, whatever she has in mind, whatever the, the lady has in mind. If I'm uh, typing or I'm strictly back behind the scenes. I'm not working so with the you're, kids. So you, you volunteer so. for the for the hospital. You yeah. volunteer for the um, uh, the schools. Mm -hmm. And what other kind of volunteering do you do? I volunteer down at the public library. Uh -huh. too. Doing what? <laughs> uh, there I just shelf read. You what? To make sure everybody puts the books back in the right place. And what if they don't? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Now, would you have some choice words for the people who don't no. put their books back, right? No. <laughs> no. How many hours do you work at the library? Uh, whenever I can, I just put it about, about an hour and a half of shelf reading is all your eyes can take. When they're, <laughs> when they're sufficiently crossed, I leave. <laughs> <laughs> you do on a weekly basis or a monthly basis? Well, I try to go once a week if I can. And sometimes, you know, I, that's what I like about it. I can go whenever I want to. And, um, they, uh, and I just spend an hour, an hour and a half or two hours, whatever it is there, and just uh, just get the in the in the, in the uh, nonfiction side where the numbers are. Ruth, you have a reputation so. for being a giver. Watch the reputation, would you? <laughs> <laughs> for being a giver and <laughs> never, never accepting any credit for it. And we want to give you that kind of credit, but um, to do so, we're going to have to ask you some questions. What about your? Um, Shall we say your, for the want of a better word, 
um, your life within the community and trying to help people who are less fortunate, who are having a lot of trouble with life and so forth. What do you do? We have a group at church that uh, we, we visit people every week. And it's a very satisfying group. You were a, a member of that group for a yes, while. Yes, many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we make calls on people in the parish as much as we can. We, or people uh, outside the parish, even. That's right. Uh, we it's visit a very the, quiet ministry. It, very quiet. Very quiet uh, ministry. No we, one knows what you do. We welcome people to the parish for the first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, go to the hospital. We go to the nursing homes. Um, Whatever, it's a very satisfying. Condolence calls, and things mm -hmm. like if that. If there's a death in the family, we go. And it's every week. It's every week. How long have you can. been doing this? Um, since about 1961, 62. 61, 62. That's the 37 mm -hmm. yeah. or yeah. eight year yeah. period yeah. that you've been doing yeah. that. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. Yeah. You were the president of that group too, were you? Uh, yes, I still am. <laughs> you still are the president of am. that group. How many members are in that group? We have eight or nine. Eight or nine people. Mm -hmm. And they do the work that um, almost no one really wants to do. Uh, well, and, but we have a commitment to do it. And I think that's what sets it apart. Yes, we're a very quiet group, but we have a commitment to do this. And we do it. Uh, because we meet every week. This is a, a group that meets every week and also works every week. And prays every week. That's right. Yeah. So, so you're a very spiritual a person and oh. very um, yeah. uh, good about <laughs> that. Um, as I remember, you also were the president or the chair of another big group in the church at one time for as long as you were, as the Constitution permitted you to be so. What was it? Well, I was a liturgy chairperson right. for a while. <laughs> In other words, but all of the liturgy. That's because I forgot to duck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure that was it. Uh, uh, trust me, I was doing the nourishment cart at the hospital. Right. And I came out of the elevator, and I was starting to push the cart down the aisle. And Father Conroy came out of, the, of one of the rooms that he was visiting at the time, came up to me, and he says, I want to talk to you for a minute. He said, I need a chairperson for the liturgy commission. How about it? And you didn't duck. <laughs> no. no. And you served as long as it's permitted to be served. Well, I served. I served two or three uh, terms, didn't you? No, there's no term. Uh, there's no term. We just started electing now. Oh, really? Yeah, there was no election before. Oh, I didn't realize no. that. And I and I wasn't there, there that long. I don't know how long. Four well, years. Four, four or five years. Four or five years. You know, years. nothing. Yeah. I mean, compared to some yeah. of the other things yeah. you've done for 35 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> and as a result of that, um, you had uh, your hand in. Uh, a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of the liturgical. Oh, yeah. um, we did the, we did the planning for the liturgy. Planning for everything. Uh, mm -hmm. We did the legwork, whatever. <laughs> the yeah. legwork for all of that. Now let's have a quick review here. Born mm -hmm. Akron, came to Wadsworth when you're two years old. Wadsworth all of your life. Went to all of the Wadsworth schools, same building. Never knew another building in town. Graduated from there. Went to Kent State University. <laughs> Graduated from there, went to Parma, came to Copley to teach, then went to Bath, and with all the rich people out there. Is that what, would it, is that accurate? <laughs> Probably not, but nah, that's what there's everyone a, thinks. There's a, there's a, yeah, but you have, your, you have your ups and downs and problems and solutions, just like you have other, any, any other else. place. Yeah. Did that for 35 years. In the meantime, you know, with your left hand and your right hand, I would hope, they're playing the organ for the church mm -hmm. and uh, volunteering here at the hospital, volunteering at the library, volunteering out at um, um, uh, bath schools, um, going around comforting the ill and those who are psychologically are having all kinds of problems and spiritually are having problems and physically are ha having problems as well, very, mm -hmm. very quietly. Um, uh, being the president of everything, you have to be very proud of that, Ruth, because you're a natural-born leader, and you have those skills which um, uh, get the job done. Uh, sometimes you um, get a little bit upset with those of us who don't do it nearly so fast as you want to do no. it, but you get the job done, and you get it done right. 
and everyone is proud of you. Ruth. It's been a joy. It's been a joy. <laughs> it's been a joy. It really has. And you don't been. seem to be wanting to stop at all. You just keep on bringing uh, on new things for uh, yourself. No, it's, it's best that you keep going. Uh, if you have too much, for me, if I have too much time on my hands, I do too much thinking, and that's not good. <laughs> What's wrong with thinking? Well, thinking goes in all different directions. Oh, I'm sure that's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm better off doing, not thinking. Doing, not thinking. <laughs> Ruth, you have a, a charming legacy that um, will long be remembered in Wadsworth, um, not only by the people whom you've touched in terms of your teaching, those people who have had the joy of hearing your voice in singing, those people who have followed your music as you played for them, those people whom you have comforted as you go to their homes, those people who are <clears throat> certainly the recipients of uh, your good works and even good hamburgers, I understand, <laughs> and things of this nature. In other words, the whole operant word here is service to people. From the time that you can remember to this present day, you have been of service to people, and people will always regard you as that. And I'm certainly pleased that you agreed to come to let us help you tell your story, which you have never told and did not want to tell, on the air so that posterity will remember it forever. Thank you, Ruth. It's been a real joy to have you. Thank you very much. It's been a joy to be here, really. Thank you.